Uh, my name is Mike Radke. I have spent the last five years as faculty at Catalysis and the last 21 years uh, working for ThetaCare in a number of different roles, including as a physical therapist, a manager uh, in ThetaCare's improvement department, and most recently as an operational vice president. So uh, looking at our learning objectives for today, uh, we want to share a high-level overview of what Kata is, uh, which is a pattern associated with daily improvement. Uh, we also want to help with the understanding of the parallels between clinical care and process improvement patterns and how to make better connections between these two similar thinking patterns uh, so we can more effectively engage others. We want to show how Kata fits into A3 thinking and practice and learn how Kata as a set of behaviors and tools help support an improvement system that strives to align, enable, and improve simultaneously. So what we want to do uh, within our agenda here today is uh, talk about that clinical, talk about that pattern of, uh, of kata um, for continuous improvement, talk about kata, what it is, uh, look at A3 thinking and how kata fit together and give you an example of that. Uh, talk about a critical element of improvement which is coaching and then move into some questions. But I want to start with a question of our own. So what does daily improvement look like today in your organization? Of course, only you know the answer to that question. But uh, with some of Bill and my experiences we'd like to share, we started learning improvement through Kaizen or Rapid Improvement Events, as many of you probably have. So for those of you not familiar, a Kaizen event is going to be a week-long project where we take a problem and work through the scientific method to end up with a, a solution to the problem uh, using A3 thinking and practice throughout it. And we had a number of solid improvements through our experience through these events, but we still found it to, although effective at times, it became almost our, our go-to pattern that we relied on for improvement. And at the same time, as we were introduced to A3 thinking and practice, we became pretty good at the was described as the left-hand side of the page, where we understood the background and current condition of a problem fairly well. We were able to craft and articulate a problem statement. We could identify the goals and targets we were trying to achieve, as well as get to even some of the potential causes. Yet, too often, those A3s and that thinking pattern ended with an action plan. And along with that, there was a lot of variability of coaching. Uh, as well as we had experience with a lean management system, which I think for both of us was life-changing as a leader, yet we still didn't have the routine for how to experiment to reach our goals, and those old habits of jumping to solutions often prevailed. So some of our key reflections were that too often we ended our improvement processes with an action plan, and improvement happened in short episodes, followed by long stretches of nothing. So the, what was the problem with our problem solving and our practice? Uh, you know, events became the only pattern for improvement. That we had incomplete A3 thinking, that we would often end with that action plan, and that we really wouldn't complete the cycle of uh, PDS and A. Uh, through our lean management system, we had huddle boards, and, which helped engage staff and, and brought them to the table to solve problems. But over time, we were focusing too much time on random problems and not problems of consequence. That uh, too often our focus was on jumping still to those old habits of finding solutions but not going through the thinking pattern that led to addressing the root causes. That we would batch improvements by, being, by working and uh, trying to work through multiple A3s at the same time, sometimes three, four, five, and, and six, which really, really resulted in us not getting to experiment. And that a lot of the problems we were working were really big problems. That could be very overwhelming, and we didn't have a process to break those problems down uh, to allow for more rapid experimentation. So in, in 2011, uh, I came across this book called Toyota Kata by Mike Rother. And in it, Mike explains his research on Toyota, where he looked beyond the tools that were obvious and well-documented and asked two key questions. So the first question that he asked was, what are the unseen managerial routines and thinking 
that lie behind Toyota's success with continuous improvement and adaptation. But probably more importantly was the second question he asked, which was, how can other companies develop similar routines and thinking in their organizations? And even for us in healthcare, I think there's a third significant question, which is, how do these routines mirror familiar patterns within clinical care? So looking at this slide, we ask ourselves, what's happening in these pictures? And I want to bring this back to those clinicians in the audience who this may be, this, uh, these diagrams may be familiar with. So let's assume that these are students of some discipline, whether these are medical students, nursing students, therapy students. And one could imagine that they're assessing a patient. And for those clinicians listening, you probably remember this well. I remember this very well. You know, going through a methodical pattern of uh, looking at how the patient is presenting, uh, what's their background, why are they here, uh, what is their current condition, what's the, what's the patient's history, what's their social history, we've got to examine the patient, uh, there's physical examination, there's different tests that we can run, there's, you know, labs and imaging tests, all trying to culminate to really what are some of the key problems that this patient is facing, what are some short-term goals, maybe for the next uh, few hours, maybe for the next day we have for this patient, as well as some long-term goals we have for them in weeks or months. Uh, what are some of the key uh, potential causes for it? And let's start implementing, uh, trying some solutions, trying some countermeasures to address some of those causes. And as we even look up into the upper left-hand uh, picture, we see something uh, familiar back in the days of us practicing as students. At the foot of the bed, we can assume that the gentleman standing there is some type of maybe an attending or a teacher who is listening for the thinking pattern of the students, challenging their thinking, and progressing uh, their thinking through questioning. As we look at this next uh, slide, I received this uh, slide from a mentor of mine, Margie Hagney, who ta has taught me a lot about A3 thinking and practice. And she uh, received this slide from uh, Dr. Jack Billy from the University of Michigan. And as we look at the pattern that is present in this slide, we can see how we start on the upper left with the history of the patient, the presenting of their symptoms, physical examination, all the way to impressions and diagnosis, and an initial treatment plan, which may be further diagnostics and or interventions. And we can uh, see how that pattern fits very well with this pattern on this slide which is a familiar version for many of us, which is the A3 from John Shook's fantastic book, Managing to Learn, where he walks us through the A3 thinking pattern. And for those of us who have practiced A3 thinking uh, in the past, we know that this is scientific thinking. We know that that A3 thinking pattern provides us with a process to get down to root cause to uh, come up with countermeasures that we can create a hypothesis, develop what we expect to happen, try something, and play that out with what, uh, uh, compare that with what actually happens, and that's where learning occurs. Yet, scientific thinking doesn't end after an initial patient evaluation, as we saw in a couple slides back. That we have to appreciate that just like, uh, just like in clinical care, after we start an A3 and we come up with an initial list of countermeasures, that it doesn't end there. Uh, or after we do a Kaizen event, then we come up with certain actions and standards that we want to put in place, it doesn't end there as well. Uh, just like for a patient, we would never consider the care of that patient to end after our initial evaluation and our initial uh, countermeasures that we put in place. So through our, the initial evaluation process, whether that's around caring for a patient or, or whether it's around improving process, that uh, there's a need to be absolutely clear about understanding our current situation. We take a comprehensive look at the presenting condition. Uh, we order additional tests. We understand the goals. We develop a list of causes, and we put initial countermeasures in place. Yet we have to appreciate what does a follow-up visit look like? And when we think of process improvement, uh, thinking of what does that follow-up visit look like where we review what our uh, targets are for the process, what's our current state today, what did we try last, uh, what did we learn from that, and what are we going to try again? So this is 
What we strive to do is to complete the A3 thinking, A3 thinking cycle, but we can't stop with our initial evaluation and treatment plans. And as students of continuous improvement, many of us have found that we need a routine for how to take what we've learned through the initial background current condition, understanding of a problem, and initial, initial countermeasures, and move to how do we experiment better? How do we take our, uh, our thinking uh, that we have, have learned through a more continuous cycle of improvement? Which leads us over to Kata, and I'll hand it over to Bill. Great, thank you, Mike. So my name is Bill Boyd. I'm the director of perioperative services currently at ThetaCare. Um, and like Mike, I share uh, an interesting and varied background at ThetaCare. I've held a, new, a number of different operational uh, titles and responsibilities throughout my years at ThetaCare, um, and I've really been on the journey of trying to employ lean within healthcare, um, really as far back as about 2004. So throughout the overall journey, I think there's just a, there's an overall premise of trying to figure out how do we employ scientific thinking. And I've really been striving for about the last 10 years to figure out how do I try to develop scientific thinking within my teams and try to bring that scientific thinking, thinking down to a, as close to a daily level as I can get. So what I'm going to do with Mike's great tee up is now I'm going to spend some time going through specifically what is CADA. And as you can see on the screen, CADA is, as it would be described, is a, is a practice routine, specifically a structured practice routine. It is a, a specific practice pattern to allow us to start to form habits. So I think about, and you can see on the screen, if we're trying to learn a new skill, if we're trying to learn everything from how to play a guitar, how to dance, um, how to drive, anytime we're trying to learn a new skill and there is a talent to that and there's a specific competency that needs to be developed, we can learn that skill by practicing certain behaviors. So what the beauty is of kata is that kata brings together a specific practice pattern together with scientific method and scientific thinking to create problem solving skills. To go a bit deeper into this, if you think about this in terms of a golf coach where a golf coach is watching what a golfer's swing is and he's watching what the outcome is and he's having conversation and he's having a coaching session while the learner, the golfer, is at that moment trying to employ new skills and trying to practice in certain ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a very similar practice that we find within kata. Kata has a coaching kata and an improvement kata and the two together are not designed to improve your golf game necessarily, but they are designed to improve your overall foundational skill and mindset around scientific thinking. So one of the things that I, I had to think about as we started down this path of trying to employ kata and as I've been trying to figure out how to do daily improvement is had to think about what are the patterns that we have and how we practice. And how we practice is really important and it's a, really a foundational element within kata. So looking at this next slide, it's a familiar example. Um, those of you who may know from the pictures, the movie, um, but in this example, we have a coach who is teaching a student, his, learn, uh, or his student, the learner in this case, how to perform the skill of karate. And there's really three steps that I want to point out within this practice pattern. So first of all, the first step is to just follow. And if you're familiar with this analogy, you may not be, but in this story, we have the coach who is asking the learner to complete a number of very menial tasks. Everything from, <clears throat> excuse me, um, washing cars to painting fences. And there becomes a critical point within the movie that this comes from where specifically the learner in this case is getting very frustrated. They've done a number of menial tasks and they're just getting very frustrated. They don't feel like they're really learning anything. And at that point in time, the coach, because they're trying to learn how to do karate, approaches the learner and asks him to defend himself in a number of different ways and he starts to use the patterns that he has learned through painting fences and washing cars to defend himself. He starts to do that second step which is detaching. He starts to use that basic pattern and to start to actually use them in function. Over the course of this movie then, uh, which is the Karate Kid movie from the 1980s, um, he eventually develops fluency and fluency is where at the end of the movie he is able to not only use those in a structured and a specifically simulated fighting pattern, but he can actually use karate to fight and becomes very fluent with the skill. So we see those three steps of how do we follow and just follow the pattern directly. 
then begin to detach and learn how to adapt, and then lastly become very fluent and use it very fluidly within our overall work. So what I love about Kata is that Kata provides that pattern. So, and what I'll describe with this is there's two different patterns we're going to specifically go through today. Um, and we'll go through these in pretty good detail. The first pattern is really the pattern of what the learner experiences. The learner experiences the improvement kata, which is understanding the direction or challenge first, then we grasp the current condition second, we establish the next target condition third, and then we move into experimenting toward the target condition. At the same time, while all of this is happening, there is a coach role within this work as well, which has its own coaching kata. And the coaching kata, there is very specific coaching cycles that are happening as we're working to collaboratively understand the direction or challenge, to then grasp the current condition and make sure that we truly understand our current condition, to establish the next target condition, and then lastly to execute coaching cycles. And we'll go through those in more detail. So I'll start out with, and if you look at the bottom corner or the bottom right hand side of the screen, we've kind of got those four steps of the improvement kata. We're going to go through those kind of simultaneously or sequentially and talk through what we experience in each of those. So in the first, we see that same pattern across the middle of the screen, but we talk about this first in terms of what are the roles within establishing your challenge. So to understand the direction or challenge, we have the role of a leader, which in many cases is the coach, where they're responsible for setting vision. They set the strategy for the organization or for that team, and they develop what is the challenge for that team. The manager, or it could be a supervisor, it could be a number of different roles in an organization, um, is responsible for then executing the improvement kata itself, and you can see the different steps within their circle of influence. The two overlap at the point of the challenge, and they overlap in the formation of that challenge and have catch ball to create that challenge. Now you might ask, how do we actually create a challenge? Um, I have in the, the screen an example of, for example, value stream mapping. I think a very familiar technique for many people. There's a number of techniques you could use from business planning to value stream mapping. Um, my experience has largely been with both you know, that business planning as well as value stream mapping to set what is the challenge. What is it that we want this team to accomplish? What is it that we want to create as far as a new condition um, within a part of our work? And we can use the value stream mapping to define a specific challenge within the work. We also have this listed under grasping the current condition because a value stream map can also give you a high level overview of what your current condition is. But as we now shift into the current condition, the, one of the beautiful things of Lean and many other improvement methodologies is we have lots of improvement tools that help us be able to understand and really grasp the current condition. So many familiar tools to, I'm sure, many of you um, around time observation, spaghetti diagrams, going to the work to not only complete analysis and observation, but you know, really making sure that we understand that current condition before we go any further. And I always try to highlight going to see because there's nothing like just going to the Gemba and really understanding what is the actual condition that's currently in place. This next visual shows, again, those same four steps, but starts to show them in a different visual representation. The challenge at the upper right, the current condition at the lower left, and we have those in that specific orientation, and the target condition, as you see, is at a, is at a point in between current and challenge. Um, you see a couple small dots between the target condition and the challenge, and I'll talk about that in a little while, about why there's multiple dots there. But specifically, the target condition is designed that it's not all the way to the challenge, um, but we have established current condition first. We don't want to set the target until we've understood what the current condition is. And then lastly, then we start to do experiments at the knowledge threshold that take us closer to the target condition itself. So a few points about target conditions. Um, a target condition is really, as, as I described on the previous slide, it's a point in time going into the future, getting closer to that challenge. We're trying to break down the challenge into smaller pieces. We're trying to take a chunk that's easier and it's on the way to the goal that the team can focus on and can start to see improvement um, that we can set the next target condition subsequently after we've reached the first target condition. Um, my experience has been that overall um, target conditions, typically I've experimented with everything from one week up to three months. Um, typically fall right now into a pattern of about a three to four week, but that's dependent upon the problem of how far out the target condition is. And the easiest way I can describe a target condition is 
if you were to grasp the current condition, in many cases, I would describe it as if you can go to that area and watch that process and peel back the roof and see what does the current condition look like, we would describe the target condition in a very similar way. It's a condition. It's not a specific metric. It's not a specific pinpoint item, but it's a condition. So if we peel back the roof and we could watch that process, we would describe the condition. How many people are in the process? What are the process steps? Uh, where is inventory building up? What do we expect just to see? The target condition itself um, is, my experience, is developed as catch wall between the learner and the coach. Um, the learner is usually extremely knowledgeable about what's happening in that process, as is the coach, and the dialogue between the two helps create the target condition. Now, the role of the coach within creating a target condition is a pretty specific role. And what we're trying to accomplish in a target condition is we're trying to accomplish setting a target that is in what we've described as the learning zone. So on the visual on the screen, we have the danger zone, which would essentially be, I always equate this to if we were to set a target that was almost all the way to the challenge, it becomes so daunting and it just kind of paralyzes the team versus if we, on the other end of the spectrum, set a target that the team knows and they have apparent certainty, as we would describe it, that they know exactly how to get to that target condition. That in itself is not a great target condition either because they know exactly what the steps are and there's not much learning that happens. One of the major goals of this process is to learn. It's one of the things that we find within the scientific method is there's an objective to learn. So we want to try to set a target in that learning zone, in a space where the team doesn't know how to get there, so that they need to complete experiments and learn their way into achieving that target condition. Which leads us to this last slide on the improvement kata, which is specifically the PDCA cycle record. There's a lot to be said around experimenting toward the, the target condition. Um, and I'm going to not go through this in great detail because we're going to walk through this in an example that Mike's going to go through shortly. I just wanted you to be familiar with the form before we get to it. So I'm going to hand it back over to Mike, and he'll take you through a little more detail. Great. Thanks, Bill. So everything Bill's talked about from identifying a challenge to understanding the current condition, even establishing what a target condition uh, might be, and then experimenting our way toward that target is right here in front of us in the A3. Yet when our practice does not reflect the full PDSA cycle, uh, learning a more rigorous pattern I think we feel like is needed. So when it comes to completing the PDSA cycle and truly performing A3 thinking in practice, uh, particularly related to the study and adjust component of it, you know, we have, we've asked ourselves a lot of questions here about you know, what pattern should we use? What practices similar to clinical experience would support more robust and ongoing process improvement? What should coaching look like within that? And what can we offer our leaders to help guide them, uh, which is I think, really the key question. So looking at, back to uh, Mike Rother's diagram here, which by the way, you know, we can't give enough attribution to Mike Rother for all the uh, sharing of his learnings that he's provided as well as encouraging us to continue to experiment, is I'm going to share more detailed what this improvement pattern looks like uh, once we've established our challenge, once we've understood the current condition, we've set a target condition, and we've started to identify potential obstacles, and how do we move past that point. So our visual management around the thinking pattern uh, starts with a storyboard. As we look at, at the storyboard, as we look at the PDSA cycle record and how they work together, it starts with understanding the target condition and the current condition. So where are we today and where do we want to be? What do we want the conditions of this process to be within the next, let's say, two weeks or three weeks, as Bill talked about? So what obstacles or what potential causes are preventing us from reaching that target? And we list out what the, some of those obstacles are. And then we define, okay, what one obstacle are we going to address and experiment towards in pursuit of that target condition? Which then leads us to, let's plan an experiment. So what are we going to try? What are we going to experiment with? And that's going to be the step. And with any good scientific thinking, then we want to be deliberate about articulating, well, what do we expect to happen? So if, if we're trying to eliminate this obstacle, we're going to try something. 
we know it very well might not work, but we want to learn. But what do we expect to happen? This may be both positive things we expect to happen as well as things of unintended consequence. Then, once we run the experiment, our current condition has changed. So now we have a new current condition. It may be a better current condition. It may be a worse current condition. But uh, we capture what our new current condition is. And then we reflect. We reflect on what are the results of that experiment. What actually happened? How does that compare to what we expected to happen? And what did we learn from that? Which sometimes we learn that we have addressed and eliminated obstacles or potential causes. Sometimes we learn that we have uncovered obstacles that we didn't know were there in the first place. But ultimately what that leads to is our next experiment and our next hypothesis about what trying that experiment will lead to. So let me take you through a specific example. We start here in this example with a healthcare system that is seeing growing competition, uh, particularly in customer satisfaction and cost. So as we look at the background, and they're framing this uh, problem in the form of an A3, where they have outpatient clinics that have a particular uh, contributor to the patient uh, satisfaction or dissatisfaction in this case, where they have really long wait times. And clinic productivity really doesn't compare very well to what benchmark indicates uh, is reasonable. So what they did is they started to examine what's the current condition. They identified that these long delays in getting an x-ray completed are happening pretty regularly within a clinic. Not only that, patients leave their exam room sometimes and they get lost. And sometimes patients get so confused that they, they leave the clinic altogether. And this is a pretty pretty massive clinic that they're working in. It isn't like x-rays just down the hallway. So in understanding the current state, they understand different elements of the process. And they've used a number of tools. They've uh, understood that the x-ray itself takes uh, five minute cycle time. But the entire time from the x-ray order until the patient is back receiving the results from the provider takes an average of 60 minutes. And the, the variation of this time can range up to 90 minutes. So ultimately, they came up with a problem statement of that the uh, clinic patients receiving x-ray have 60-minute wait time prior to receiving a diagnosis, resulting in decreased satisfaction and, and clinic flow delays. So the goal or target is to go from this average of 60 minutes to, OK, we've got to get to 10 minutes. Uh, total total time from order to x-ray results, we want it to be 10 minutes. So that's a pretty, can be a pretty daunting objective. How do we get from 60 minutes to 10 minutes? I mean, that's a massive improvement we're looking at. And as we look at the, the right-hand side and the countermeasures, there's lots of potential causes and lots of solutions that we could try. And uh, as we have alluded to earlier, some of our previous experience has been, well, here's a a completely viable list of solutions. Let's just put all these potential solutions in place and that should solve our problem, right? Well, what we found through practical experience is that's not the case. Uh, so as we look at how we can use Kata to help frame this, it gives us a, a bit of a different pattern. So let's move over to our storyboard. So as we look at the storyboard, it provides us with the focus process, which is patient transport to and from x-ray. And the challenge is the same as it was on the A3, which is we've got to get this x, the order to x-ray result in 10 minutes. Now, once we've identified that challenge, there's different elements of the current condition that we do understand, that that variability is from 10 to 95 minutes. The average cycle time is 60 minutes. There are two x-ray technologists working in this department, and that three patients are leaving without treatment a treatment plan per week. So when Bill talked about previously, let's set a target condition, which is a description of how we want this process to be performing as if we fast forward in time, uh, two weeks for example in this case, what do we want to see? Well in this case we set a target condition for decreasing variability to 10 to 30 minutes. Uh, we, don't, we didn't feel like we were going to be able to get all the way to our 10 minutes, but we wanted to to start on that path with our first target condition. We still believe that we, we uh, believe this process will take two x-ray technologists to perform based off of the clinic uh, volume that they have, but we want to have zero patients leaving without a treatment plan. 
And I think this is a, an example of how we set target conditions that are in pursuit of our challenge, but aren't all the way there. And that helps us to, uh, helps the team and the learner to be able to think of, okay, I can, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I can start to experiment towards that target condition, even though I may have absolutely no clue and it's very intimidating about how do I get to that challenge. So once we've identified the target condition, the gap between the current and the target helps expose some of the obstacles. Some of those we've talked about already, which are the patients getting lost, uh, the patients don't understand that they need to return to the clinic, the tech's not available, the clinic room gets reassigned, so on and so forth. So what we need to do at this point is define what obstacle are we going to start to work on and let's plan our first experiment. So in this case, the team picks, hey, the patient's getting lost. So what can we start to experiment with to address patients getting lost? So as we look at the PDSA cycle re record and start to fill that out with our first experiment, the team takes that and says, well, what could we start to do? How about we have the x-ray staff go get the patient? So once the order is placed in the clinic, uh, that, that is uh, make it pretty clear through our, the electronic system that a patient is in the clinic needing an x-ray. Let's have the x-ray tech go and get the patient. Okay, so by doing that, what do we expect to happen? Well, we expect the patient won't get lost if they're being ex escorted, but there may be some unintended consequences too. We think x-ray may run behind. So as we run that experiment, what do we find out? Well, we find out that it does decrease time, but we also may have found out that, that patients aren't always ready. We weren't anticipating that, that, that someone came to get the patient so quickly that they weren't prepared so that there was wait time there. Um, we also didn't put any experiments in place to address the fact that the room got reassigned while the patient was gone. So we learned some things. We learned that the patients certainly appreciated the, the treatment that they uh, got by having someone escort them, but we also learned that we needed better communication between departments. We learned that x-ray wasn't familiar even with the clinic setting itself as far as how to find the patient. And we also, we, uh, one other thing we could put up there is we, we learned that uh, we weren't anticipating that x-ray was going to be there so quickly. So what that leads us to is identifying what obstacle may, we, may, we may have addressed by that experiment what new ones did we learn? We learned some new uh, obstacles exist now, and we want to plan our next experiment, which in this case is we have x-ray is going to continue to get the patient, but let's try something with regard to the room reassignment as far as let's put a reserve sign in the room. And we think this is going to decrease time, that the room won't get reassigned, uh, and then we run the experiment. Um, it decreases time. Uh, but other patients may be getting delayed because they're not getting roomed as efficiently as they were before, even though they were, you know, kind of quote unquote stealing another patient's room. And the PDSA cycle continues. So X ray uh, wayfinding is improving, um, but X rays may be getting fatigued from all this movement. So, you know, as you can see, and, and this is a real life situation where lots of learning happening here, but none of the learning would have happened unless we uh, started to experiment. And really that's the, that's the beauty of what we see here is what they found is that this is scientific thinking and practice. They're using the A3 to frame their problem, prepare themselves to begin experimenting, and then they use the improvement kata within the A3 to perform rapid experiments on their way to a target condition, which is ultimately getting them closer to the challenge while simultaneously teaching a model of scientific thinking and practice to all involved, not just uh, the, the, some of the key players here, which may be the learner, but also to the whole team who's working on this. And it's engaging them every day as we experiment. But we're still missing a key ingredient of the, the kata pattern which is coaching. So that's what Bill is going to be talking about next, is how does coaching fit into this pattern? Thank you, Mike. That's a great example. You know, a lot of our examples in healthcare are very complex and messy and kind of complicated. So making sure that we are staying true to scientific thinking through that process as we try to dissect the problems um, can be really challenging. And that's where that role of a coach does come in play. 
And we talked about it at a high level before the coaching kata, and now we're going to spend some more time describing what that means. So the coaching kata is really that partnership of the coach observing through a specific pattern of questions and working with the learner. So observing the learner, seeing what the learner's work is and the learner's thinking is, and then working together to create problem solving ex expertise and really improving their abilities. So I like this quote, this is Matul Gawande and it says, no matter how well trained people are, few can sustain their best performance on their own. That's where coaching comes in and coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. So I love this quote because you know, he really highlights the done well portion of this. The question for me was always, as I'm trying to go out and coach my teams and I'm trying to go out and help support the overall improvement of my team in their scientific thinking, is how do I know how to be a good coach? How do I know what questions to ask? How do I know what behaviors are the right behaviors to help reinforce what I was ultimately looking for, which was the use of scientific thinking and problem solving. So if we go back to this first visual, we see that there is interaction between the coach and the learner all the way through the first three steps of the improvement kata, working together to make sure we have framed and understand the direction of the challenge, making sure that we have grasped the current condition, we truly understand what's happening, and then lastly, working together to establish and set the next target condition, setting that next milestone on the way to the ultimate challenge. The last piece we're going to talk through is how do we specifically coach, though, around more of that daily rapid experimentation? This is a piece where, from my experience, it was always very nerve-wracking to try to go out and figure out how do I go out and coach? How do I go out and coach specifically to get my teams to try experiments, to learn from their experiments, to predict what they would see within their experiments. Um, just to experiment at all can be a challenge in some cases. So what I found within Toyota Kata is in the coaching Kata we find a very specific set of questions and if we go back to how we practice in the beginning we just follow the pattern which in this case I'm going to go right through the questions. In a interaction between the learner and the coach, the coach asking the learner what is the target condition? What is the actual condition now? If they've completed an experiment, we go to the back side of the card and we look at the questions that really reflect on that last experiment. What did you plan as that last step and what did you expect? We try to make sure we're always recording or we, we don't try to make sure, we make sure that we record. What do we expect before we take that step? After we've taken that step, what actually happened? What did you learn? This is where a lot of the, the study and adjust is really critical on that reflection step. We've got to spend time in this area. And then we come back to the other side of the, the questions card and we then go through the questions of what obstacles do we think are presenting, preventing us from reaching the target condition? And specifically, which one are you addressing now? What is your next experiment or essentially your next step? And what do you expect is going to happen? And then lastly, we end with how quickly can we go and see what we've learned from taking that step? So. I would, I would share my experience as a coach is trying to find ways to always coach to see how quickly is a very key piece. We're trying to create rapid experiments because the more rapid experiments we can complete, the more rapidly, rapidly we can learn, and the more rapidly we learn, the more we can move quickly to our target condition. So. For me, this was kind of that aha moment where, as a coach, I now have a pattern I can follow. I have something I can start with. And even if I'm just in that practice pattern, just following, um, I'm not even detaching. I'm not fluent yet. I've got a starting point. So this is all about habit development um, and specifically about how do we develop habits. And I think about not only as a coach, but as a learner going to the work, going to the Gemba and spending time at the storyboard, having this coaching session and this interaction helps ingrain and helps coach towards scientific thinking and helps me learn how to coach and become a better coach to reinforce scientific thinking. So to give you kind of a high level visual of what this looks like in the actual practice, so we see on the right hand side the learner with their team um, at the storyboard practicing the improvement cotton. and we've talked through those four specific steps. We then see the coach and the coach and learner have a, a double-sided arrow between them as they're practicing the coaching kata. Um, typically, my experience has been that's a more of a one-on-one -on -one interaction, so they can have more dialogue about 
the thinking that's happening specifically. And then the second coach is somebody who has ideally been a coach for a while and can spend time observing the coach as they're coaching and working with the learner to help coach the coach to be more effective at even how they coach. The entire purpose of this is to create new habits around scientific thinking and coaching skills both. So for me, the one of the big takeaways for this is as I described in the beginning, um, there was this nervousness to go out and how do I coach my teams and specifically how do I help my teams work through scientific thinking and really take scientific thinking into the work on a daily basis. Um, the improvement kata and the coaching kata both were solutions that gave me a pattern. They gave me something that I could work towards. They gave me something that I could teach my team to try to replicate that pattern and we continue to, on a regular basis, continue to work this pattern and work this new practice and really have started to engrave this into habit. Now, I, think, I do think it's important we spend just a minute to talk about. Within this visual, what we're trying to illustrate is that the pattern that we're trying to create is that there's a portion of your day that is carved out for overall improvement with the improvement kata or the coaching kata, depending upon your role in the improvement work that you're doing. So we know within your workday, there's a whole range of things that you need to do. There is, there's, there's the firefighting or the troubleshooting that just inevitably seems to pop up. There's a lot of things that are just regular things that just have to happen every day. And then beyond that, there is this portion of our day that what we encourage is to create a habit. Create that pattern of every day at a certain time in a certain way. We go into the work and we start practicing the patterns with kata because as soon as we start practicing with them, we will start learning. Um, I bring you back to this last visual, and again, the relationship just between the improvement kata and the coaching kata. There is a pattern that you can use to work with your teams. Um, if you are the learner, there's a pattern you can use to take really big problems and take them and break them into smaller pieces and then work with your teams to improve and see significant improvement with. Um, and as a coach, if you've got nervousness around being a coach, I know I did initially, uh, you, know, you, can, you can use this pattern and you'll learn and over time you will get better and better at coaching.